Hi guys, welcome back on the channel. Happy New Year to all of you. I wish health and happiness to you and your families and hopefully more time for Wargaming. In today's video, we're going to have a brief overview um, of Baron's Wars rules. These are not the workshops many of the friends of the channel are asking when the workshops will start that will go into detail in the mechanics of the rules. Uh, this, uh, you know I'm a stickler for accuracy and until at least part of the armies are painted that we can use the actual Baron's Wars miniatures, I don't want to do any uh, mechanics or any workshops. I don't want to use my Hundred Years War miniatures. Uh, it's not you know, appropriate. Uh, we need to see what we're talking about. I don't know, I have, uh, you know, heavily armored, uh, full plate armored knights and uh, talking about uh, Baron's Wars sergeants. So this workshop will come as soon as some of my units are completed. Uh, we'll start this because I'm also excited um, to uh, work on the mechanics of the rules. So today we're going to have a brief overview of things that I like, things that I'm not so sure about, and innovation. So our first chapter, as you show, is about customization. The amount of customization you have in these rules is incredible. It's really incredible. And sometimes it gets a bit overwhelming, but actually it's not at all. You can customize your troops as you like. The process of thought behind this customization is excellent. It has been thoroughly researched, and I think uh, the rules and the customization of the weapons and the armor make sense. Um, you can have different types of troops. Okay, this is something that is common in, uh, in rule sets, but uh, what I really liked is that the possibility of green troops, that are unexperienced troops, you have uh, veteran troops, uh, you have um, regular troops, irregular troops, and these troops have different characteristics, different equipment that they can carry, different armor that they can use. So this is something very interesting to me, and it works quite well. You have, obviously, different weapons that you can use that give you advantages and disadvantages. For example, a double-handed weapon will uh, give you an extra modifier when attacking, but you will always attack second. Um, heavier armor, like male armor, will reduce your um, movement, uh, but at the same time it will give you better defense. So all the weapons that you can customize your units with, and obviously not all weapons go with all units, will give you advantages and disadvantages very well thought of. You have a double-handed weapon, you cannot carry a shield, you can use a lance but only once, um, and then you have different uh, shields, small, medium and large, that will give you, again, advantages in defense. So all this customization really uh, is very, very interesting. Why? Because it gives you an opportunity to fight different games every time, especially the customization of the commanders, the commanders that have also abilities. You can have mounted, you can have foot commanders, obviously something common, but he can be a baron, he can be a lord, he can be a veteran, and then you can, you customize them with different, you know, swords or shields, or you get uh, a different war horse. What I liked in the rules were the war horse and the bodied horse types, where they give you advantages in movement, and but some other disadvantages. Also abilities. Some abilities are require an action to be spent, some abilities are passive, and these abilities are really, um, if, you, if you read them, there are so many, and obviously you cannot use all for your commanders, and depending on what type of commander you have, um, it, 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 it's the process of thought behind these abilities shows that the author has investigated the era, has thought about the era, and is giving, a really is spicing up the game. Um, you can have... Um, um, Counter charge, you can have courageous, you can have uh, cruelty, last stand, martial training. There's so many uh, ac ac uh, description of abilities that commanders have. So, with this customization, what is happening is that basically you can fight a different game every time. Uh, a different commander with different abilities have different characteristics, so the strategy will be different depending on your troops, if they're green, if they're veteran, if they're regular, regular, they can take a specific weapons and specific abilities that they may have and react differently. So all this customization is very impressive. I think it works well. And uh, I think it gives the opportunity for a player to play very different games uh, with the same miniatures. 
um, something that I haven't seen very often in other games. So that's a very, very positive thing and something that we're going to focus on our, in our workshops. So second point is innovation. So let's talk about innovation and something that um, I was a bit, um, let's say, um, doubt, I had doubts about it. And after playing a couple of uh, test games, uh, I realized it works. So what the rules do, the rules provide uh, different results for different dice numbers and don't get confused when I'm going to say this it's going to be very simple so uh, if you roll a d10 so let's get a bit closer and see what am I talking about so when you're rolling uh, you can roll in these rules you roll a d10 and you have also a d6 so let's go to the d10 when uh, um, an attacker rolls a zero in a d10 when he's attacking um, this is considered a critical hit it's considered that it's very strong hit and cannot be defended unless the defender rolls another zero, another ten. These are newlyfied. This attack, this successful attack, obviously because a ten is successful attack, is newlyfied only by another zero. Now, another thing with the dice is that if the defender rolls a one, if the defender rolls a one, it fails. Obviously, a one fails, but. Um, in the mechanics of the rules, uh, while you can, if you have shield, you can roll a second um, set of dice to defend the undefended hits from the initial attack. We'll go to this um, mechanics a bit later. But this is considered such a weak dice that it cannot be given a second chance. Actually, I played this um, mechanics uh, back home I had a little bit of time with my hundred years war miniatures and it really works it makes sense it's not gamey at all as I thought about it and it's very interesting and it makes sense that uh, when you're rolling the higher dice will give you some advantages and the lower dice will give you some disadvantages we're not talking about all the dice two three four five six seven eight nine the, these are normal dice rolls but one and zero have difference one in defense means that you don't get the opportunity to try a second defense with your shield and we're going to talk about this mechanics so it's a very weak response but zero from the attacker is a very strong attack it cannot be defended very well you know it's a powerful attack and it can be defended only by powerful defense so zero uh, negate zero not gamey at all it works and i think it's very innovative we're going to talk about this when the mechanics come. Now, another thing that uh, interests me, and I thought it worked really well again, is um, when you are charging. So when you're charging, let's say here we have the miniatures, let's have a look. So when you're charging, a unit has um, a distance. But if the opponent is further than his movement distance, that's his charge distance, you can decide to roll a d6 and you get the result in inches. And if you manage to um, close the gap between your movement, your charge movement, and the opponent, uh, you will have a successful charge. Otherwise, there are some other um, options that you have. You stop on your tracks, etc. So let's say that this knight and this knight is the first miniature I ever painted with this knight. I studied with Baron Wars. Um, my thing was Baron Wars, that's why I have Baron Wars armies for 15 mm's. And these are my first miniatures I ever painted. This guy and this guy. I think these are, um, um, these are from Foundry. I didn't do a very a bad job, I think. I think it looks good. This is painted maybe 25 years ago. I was around 20... 324 years old back in the UK where I was studying and this guy also I don't remember how I got them or where I got them I'm going to add them to the armies um, that I will get from Futsal but I think it was not bad don't what you think anyway these are the first miniatures ever painted I found them somewhere lying around back home in Greece so you have this gap between your movement and your opponent that you need to um, tackle with the d6 so you roll a d6 let's say you roll and you roll a six well that's fine so if you roll a six this means a very powerful charge it's it's different by you know it's very different when you're rolling a six if you roll a four it doesn't mean you require six maybe you require only a one or maybe you require only a two so that shows that you have it's a strong powerful charge 
This six will give you an extra diff attack die. If you roll a one and the charge successful, so that means that probably if you have movement of seven and your opponent is eight, you roll a one and you succeed. This removes one attack dice from you. Again, I played these mechanics, I checked them out, they work very well. And it makes sense. It makes sense that the top die and the bottom die are, have some kind of um, difference, some kind of advantage or disadvantage. It makes sense and it makes the game quite fun. Not gamey at all. I really liked it. It really works. So you roll a six, let's say you require a one, you roll a six, you attack with a six. It gives you have two dice, for example, attacking. It gives you one extra die. You roll a one, you have two dice of attacking, it removes one of the dice. So this is another thing that makes the die rolls matter. Again, two, three, four, five, don't have any, um, let's say, it would have been too much for uh, other die rolls. But the top and the bottom, or the worst and the best uh, numbers, it's really, not makes sense, it makes fun, and it makes sense. Yes, I roll a six, I should be rewarded for the six. I roll a one, okay, it works, but, you know, the one is terrible dice, even though, you know, I can, I can, I can close the gap. So this is another... Um, innovative, I think, idea by the author that um, makes the game more fun. And I, I, I tell you, it works quite well and makes the dice, the die rolling, have a matter in some things. You know, getting extra, an extra dice while you're attacking is not, a, is not a small feat. So this is the innovation I wanted you to, to talk about. So let's come now and talk about uh, some rules uh, that I like and I found interesting and some uh, things I found uh, a little bit um, not to my taste. So let's start with the good things. Now, a rule that I really enjoyed and I thought it was very clever and innovative. I don't remember I've seen it a long time. Okay, rules generally um, uh, recycle, not recycle, you know, take from one another, especially, you know, new rule sets pick up ideas from very old rule sets and they incorporate them. Yeah, nothing can be 100% innovative. But I have this really, really um, uh, good rule that I enjoy. So let's say that this guy, this mounted knight, has a bodied war horse. If he has a bodied war horse, he is subject to the overrun rule. Now, this is a very, very interesting rule that I really like, and it works really, really well, makes sense. During the, 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 the Baron Wars, it was not like the Hundred Years' War where Edward III um, devised, not devised, used the long bow uh, more than before, and, uh, you know, it was a devastating weapon. Um, at that time, the you know the masters of the of the battlefield were the mounted knights. So this rule: if you have a bodied warhorse, you are subject to uh, the overcharge rule. So let's let's see the mechanics. So we attack. Let's say he this guy is attacking and he causes uh, some hits and some wounds and removes um, two miniatures. So let's say he moves. No, actually, one in the back. Let's move in front. But anyway, let's move two miniatures okay so we're in this position now now this this unit is subject to uh, pushback uh, how you get pushed back something I will talk afterwards uh, you move one inch plus one inch for every casualty you have two casualties so you move back three inches so let them let's move them back three inches so he will move back obviously close to the bridge so they move three inches back now, subject to the overcharge rule, now that you defeated your opponent, you roll a d6 and the number of casualties from the combat and determine the overcharge. And this overcharge will be counted uh, from the back of the pushed back unit. So let's see, so we have two casualties and we need uh, to roll a d6. So let's roll a d6. So we roll a one. And we have also three casualties, so it's a four. So how this thing works, so we go four behind the pushback location, and here is the overcharge rule. Here is where, where my unit will go, four inches behind the pushback location of the defeated unit. And then you have to rein in the horses. A very innovative rule I consider I like a lot. Now, 
So there is a discussion about two things. There was a discussion at the group and in some um, sites regarding the power of uh, the longbow in all the archers and the rules and how devastating they are. Um, the response from some guys was that, you know, the game is designed obviously uh, to play in a skirmish level and with a lot of cover. Um, my answer would have been different. Um, the Bodkin Arrow was used first by the Vikings and was developed and used along the Middle Ages. The longbow appeared in the scene in 1188. That the longbow was not used in the way that Edward III used it and changed the warfare of the Middle Ages, especially the Hundred Years' War, doesn't mean that it was not devastating at that time if it was used in mass. The Bodkin and the Longbow at that time would have been deadly considering the quality of armor. 90% was non-existent, you know, leather armor, and the high bone knights had mail. Again, quite difficult to defend Bodkin arrows. So for me, it doesn't really affect the game that the Longbow is strong in the game because it was strong. It was never used in mass effect like it was did during the Hundred Years' War, and but because at that time the warfare was mounted and how that's how the English fought and that's how they got decimated from Robert the Bruce. Uh, but when Edward changed this and used the longbow as a mass um, weapon of fire, um, things changed. But Bodkin arrows and longbows were there for a long, long time now in Baron Wars. So that the criticism that the longbow is very strong, it's not a criticism. It should be like this. It was devastating and if it was used like it was used during the Hundred Years War would have created havoc, but it was not used. So this is one thing I would like to explain. Now, I want to talk about a couple of things now regarding pushbacks that I like and cohesion and how do I make my battles bigger. This is a small skirmish game. You know, I like skirmish games recently like Blood and Crowns, but I'm not very happy with units of being four or five. You remove very easily miniatures and you start doing cohesion tests and it's getting really annoying. Not, you know, for me. I want my units more robust, but we'll get to this one at the end of the game. And in, in the end of the video, the house rules. So another rule I like very much is the pushbacks. Now you're fighting, and let's say this knight attacked this, let's say, foot men at arms or whatever you call them. Now I like that not all pushbacks are the same, and this makes sense. If you know you lost or you were you know devastated, you would push back more, you know, than if you had only one casualty. So the, the pushback of every unit that is losing depends on how many miniatures he uses. He loses, the, the unit loses. So, for example, the unit falls back one inch, standard, and then one inch for every miniature lost. So the more miniatures you lose, the further back you will go. Another thing I like is that if it's a draw, the both um, units will be pushed back one inch. Another quite interesting rule that I really enjoy. What I don't like is that um, when you push back a unit, and let's say this unit is pushed back, let's say this is the location and it's pushed back, you cannot continue the melee. I like um, the possibility of units continuing melee. Um, it doesn't change the rules. It's really very easily house ruled. But let's say you push back a unit uh, four inches. If your distance allows it, if your movement distance allows it, I would prefer to have a rule that this, the unit will follow up and melee will continue. Again, this doesn't change the basics of the game. You need, again, to give an order. You need to give an action to your unit to attack. But it keeps coherency. And it for me, it makes sense that if a, a, a unit that won has the distance, is pushing back the opponent, he has to follow up. So something that I, it's something that I like, it's a personal taste. I don't like units being separated all the time, but I like very much the idea of a unit being pushed back um, different distances depending on the devastation they occurred. And also I like the idea that if you have a draw, both units will be pushed back uh, one inch and they will not be in contact. This I like very much. Now, the last thing that I want to uh, talk about, and this is again personal taste, is the size of a unit. Now, the size of a unit is not determined, it's not um, dictated by the author. It tells you uh, you can use any size unit you want, but it's dictated by the two inch rule of coherency. So, two inch, like a uh, radius, uh, 
you have to be um, it has to be your unit. So this really um, restricts you. So do, so if you do three inch radius, uh, that as is for the knights, you can easily have bigger units. And why do I like bigger units? Because this game has an innovation that I haven't seen before. And let's go and see. So let's say we have a unit of 12 miniatures because we have a 3 inch cohesion rule and uh, they're fighting with the knights. Uh, these are some Perry um, Levy and I think it was the closest thing I had to Baron Wars. So let's say they fight with 3 knights. As per the rules, uh, let's say we have 3 knights here, uh, the units that are touching the opponent are fighting and plus the units 1 inch from these units. So basically what you will do in this situation you will have one inch from the units fighting already, and that means the second row. So what you have, you have, you have basically one, two, three, four, five, six miniatures fighting. The other six are not fighting. They are part of the battle. They are part of the pushbacks or the victory, but they're not fighting. They're not engaged. This is very interesting. It works really well because this is actually historical accuracy not everybody was fighting the people in the back were pushing were supporting so in this way you roll six dice you will have casualties from this six that they're fighting and unless it's a devastating attack you're not going to have every five minutes a uh, break test or, uh, or or a resolve test and the units will be more robust and you will have in my opinion in my personal taste more fun and it makes real sense and i think this is a very innovative rule it's actually the rule of the game but when you have six miniatures obviously everybody's fighting because almost everybody's one inch from the units that they are touching the opponent but if you have bigger units of eight that is allowed in the game i think or 12 that's my personal favorite the two inch cohesion rule it kind of but maybe you don't need to change it do you see two inches yeah it fits actually yeah actually it fits actually you don't need to house rule this at all yeah it's not a big issue Two inches it fits. So I like the idea that the rules allow a specific number of miniatures to fight. Not all, because uh, it makes sense that the first two rows would fight and the others will be supporting in the back or they will be part of the calculation for break tests or resolve tests because they are 12, but the fighters are in front and then you remove from the front and you continue with the remaining. So this is another uh, rule that I like. So guys, this was a very simple overview of what I like of the rules. I promise the workshops are coming with very, very nice miniatures that currently paint, and we're gonna have, we go extensively in perks, in abilities, in customization of your units, and uh, what the swords, what the double-handed weapons, what the bills um, uh, give or take away, because always a, a weapon or an armor gives something, but also takes something back. And um, I think these rules are quite, quite interesting, and I think they are quite fun and innovative. So this is my first approach. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you liked what you saw. I thank you so much for watching. The showcases for the Baron Wars are coming soon. We're preparing currently the armies. I hope you will enjoy them and then we'll start our workshops, of course, in parallel with other 100 Years War stuff. Anyway, guys, again, Happy New Year. Thank you so much for watching and bye-bye.